by Professor Philippe Sands QC, Professor of International Law at University College London. So welcome and thank you for coming along. Um, we'd like to ask you some questions about what complicity means and I think it might help if I actually read out the memorandum from Sir Michael Wood that we've been debating in the previous session because I think that's at the nub of what we're talking about before I ask you one or two questions about it. And the memo is dated the 13th of March 2003 and it says, uh, this is to, uh, uh, to our previous witness, your record of our meeting with HMA Tashkent, uh, sorry, it's not to him, it's about him. Your record of our meeting with HMA Tashkent recorded that Craig had said that his understanding was that it was also an offence of the UN Convention on Torture to receive or possess information under torture. I said that I did not believe that this was the case, but undertook to reread the Convention. I have done so. There is nothing in the Convention to this effect. The nearest thing is Article 15, which provides for the invisibility and evidence of any statement which is established to have been made as a result of torture. This does not create any offence. I would expect that under UK law, any statement established to have been made as a result of torture would not be admissible as evidence. Now, in your evidence to us, uh, Professor Sands, you say that uh, in a formal and limited sense, Mr Wood's response is correct, but it seems not to address the issue in the round. Is, Mr. is Sir Michael's legal advice incorrect because it failed to mention the offence of complicity in Article 4? Well, I, th I think the first thing I'd say is I, I wouldn't treat this document as a formal legal advice in that sense. It's a letter addressed to another civil servant that purports to address a very narrow question and doesn't purport to give a full reasoned legal opinion uh, on the subject. Um, what I say in my written evidence is that insofar as the letter seeks to address a very narrow question, it's not formally inaccurate. But, but it misses the bigger point, which you've heard, I think, addressed in your previous witness's contribution, namely, in what circumstances might the receipt of information obtained through torture constitute complicity within the meaning of Article 4 of the Convention. And for, for apparently obvious reasons, it doesn't deal with that. But it is important uh, to recall that Article 15 says what it says. Article 15 doesn't say it is not appropriate to rely on information obtained by torture for purposes other than court proceedings. And this issue arose, and it's probably sensible to jump straight to it, uh, in the case of A and others, uh, a judgment in the House of Lords written, uh, the main judgment by Lord Bingham, on the 8th of December 2005, at paragraph 47. And this issue came up very, very directly uh, in argument. It's one thing, obviously, Article 15 excludes the possibility of relying on torture evidence, as one might call it, in legal proceedings. It's quite another to raise the question of whether it can be used for other purposes. And what Lord Bingham says is, if under such torture a man revealed the whereabouts of a bomb in the Houses of Parliament, the authorities could remove the bomb and, if possible, arrest the terrorist who planted it. There'd be a flagrant breach of the obligation not to torture, for which the United Kingdom would be answerable, but no breach of other obligations of the Convention. This, yet the Secretary of State accepts that such evidence would be inadmissible in court proceedings, and then the key sentence, this suggests that there is no correspondence between the material on which the Secretary of State may act and that which is admissible in legal proceedings. In other words, a tiny door is open to use, in certain limited circumstances, material that may have been obtained by torture. But that doesn't mean that all material used or obtained in all circumstances doesn't cross a line into complicity. And the grey area that is a complex area is at what point does the systematic receipt of information cross a line into complicity? Okay. Well, basically what Lord Bingham was saying is you could use a one-off piece of torture evidence as a shield to protect people, but you can't use it as a sword as part of the prosecution. I think, as we know, Lord Bingham is a man who chooses his words very, very carefully, yeah. and he, I think, is recognising a commonsensical reading of the Convention, but he is not saying that the systematic... Uh, participation in the receipt of hundreds or thousands of pieces of information obtaining from a situation in which torture is known to occur would not cross a line into complicity. He simply doesn't address that issue. Uh, we can speculate as to what he would say, but that's not 
what he's addressing here. Well, I think we'll come into that in a little more detail about the qualitative or quantitative line and where it's drawn. But, but what do you think the significance in practice of Sir Michael Wood's advice was in, 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 in these circumstances or more generally within the Foreign Office as that advice became wider known? Well, you're asking in a sense for a matter of speculation. I've known Michael Wood for many years. I have very great respect uh, for Michael Wood. I know him to be a man who gives robust, independent uh, advice. As I read this letter, um, I interpret this letter as intended to head off uh, an irritant. Um, a problem has arisen. Someone is raising issues. What's the bare minimum that needs to be said? in order to get rid of this issue. Um, it, it is not addressing other issues. It doesn't address Article 4. And in my evidence, uh, I indicate uh, that it may well be that Sir Michael Wood or other lawyers or the law officers address the meaning and effect of Article 4 uh, of the Torture Convention. But this doesn't address that, and for that reason, it doesn't give a complete answer. Okay. Um, you described Lord Bingham's words as a sort of um, opening, a small opening. I can't remember the word you used that would enable the government to come up with a position, but isn't it the case that they've actually just leapt through it and very much relied on that approach because the Foreign and Commonwealth Officer's Annual Report on Human Rights 2008, published in March 2009, uh, says um, the use of intelligence possibly derived through torture presents a very real dilemma given our unresolved condemnation of torture and our, effort and our efforts to eradicate it, where there is intelligence that bears on threats to life, we cannot reject it out of hand. Um, what is quite clear, however, is the information obtained as a result of torture would not be admissible in any criminal civil proceedings in the UK. So, I mean, they're just saying that's the position, and they are relying on that. So they're not, they don't have to work very hard to do that, do they? Well, they're, they're, they're fudging, in, in a sense. I mean, they're expressing a commonsensical position. You get the odd bit of information that's been obtained under torture. It provides information that may head off some serious attack. What do you do? Do you just ignore it? And they're saying, no. But, but what they're not addressing with is whether or not there is a policy of systematically relying on such information. What I just read out is consistent with Lord Bingham's judgment in your view. Well, it, it may be. What I don't know is the factual background against which that is written. I have information as to what is in the public domain. I have access to certain information through my professional practice as a barrister, which, for reasons you understand, I, I can't address in this forum. Uh, I have uh, that. If they're talking about a very limited piece of information or pieces of information, that may be one thing. It's quite another thing, if we to take that scenario of those words, uh, if we were to imagine a situation in which Her Majesty's Government were to engage in an arrangement with a country which was known to torture in a widespread way, in which it would turn a blind eye to what was going on, receive all of the information, uh, not participate physically in the torture, that I think is not what Lord Bingham had in mind. 